so let it be written, so let it be done. My name is Tim and you're watching Tabletop Terrors. Uh, if this is your first time watching the channel, Tabletop Terrors, uh, it's me and my brother James and we're all about helping people be more creative and we do that using Tabletop RPGs. <clears throat> and so, this is Daily Damage, this is a live vlog conversational stream where I walk and talk so if that's not your kind of video you probably want to check out some of our other more edited videos this is definitely stream of consciousness uh, I'm getting a little more in shape so there's a tiny bit less huffing and puffing but I, I always sound out of breath and so I've also had people tell me that it's really nerve-wracking to hear all the traffic <laughs> So, uh, anyway, one final thing. This is a live chat, and so I will be replying to comments and talking to people. So, welcome. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the number one design trick that I learned. It's very, very simple, um, but it's, it's one that I see a lot of designers miss. It's a very, very important one. But, um, oh, I also shared the link around to a few different groups today. Uh, in Facebook and so we'll see who turns up <laughs> and uh, so yeah I'm gonna check the chat right now and then after that I want to give a special shout out to Warmaker 777 uh, and he has done something awesome and I want to tell you guys what it is but first let's check in and see who's here what you looking at a prime Abtabian What's going on? Well met, he says. Crino, am I saying that right? C R E A N O. Crino. So, sup, dude. Sup, Crino. Dr. Professor, sir. It's good to see you this morrow. Hey, hey. Wild Picks is here. Good afternoon. Uh, is that a target on your shirt? Is actually a Captain America shield. Uh, it's uh, my Winter Soldier t shirt. Karen Davies is here. Hello. Oh, sweet. Crino. Perfect. He said I'm pronouncing it right. So, super huge uh, shout out to Warmaker777, a constant in these chats. Warmaker777 has volunteered to edit together a series that I've been trying to make for a while now. Uh, and this series is called Hit Points. And so hit points is points that we want to hit on, but the reason why you probably will like them, if you want to hear the most concentrated pieces of these live streams, as well as like area of effect, what hit points will be are videos that are like between three and 10 minutes long, recapping one major point of these videos. What this is really good for, as far as the channel goes, is for people who don't have the time to watch these or participate live, it's a really good opportunity to just get the tips. These are really good gateway videos. So, you know, getting new people in. And so, I'm gonna have a playlist of these things. So my goal, Warmaker777 is editing away. And it's pretty cool, he's done some like, very like, interesting things to make it more enjoyable. Just little production things that are really good. But I hope to start posting those next week. That would be really cool. So Tabletop Terror's hit points, and I'm thinking of posting them in the evenings, like have them go live at like 7 p.m. Uh, and if we can do three in a week, great. If we do one, great. If we do five, great. I wanna kind of leave that open. They'll, they'll come when they come, but. So, uh, I do wanna dive into the topic here, and it's that I see a ton of people, they love RPGs, they wanna write RPGs, and so I found that designing RPGs and playing RPGs, not surprisingly, uses two very different parts of the brain. And so I feel that it's very important to try to engage both parts of your brain when you're designing. It's easy to get stuck in a vacuum as a game designer and start making all these tables and rules. And uh, I'll give you a great example. 
So, as a game designer, if a player gets a magic ruby, we have a propensity if the player says, hey DM, I wanna affix this magic ruby to my armor. Instead of just saying, yeah, that sounds cool. A lot of DMs, and this is part of the fun of it, will then say, okay, I'm gonna create a system of rules and mechanics of how you can affix gems to armor. And then what ends up happening is it starts to be this seven page dock with all these different kinds of gems. And this one gives plus one to athletics, but a red gem gives plus one specifically to swimming and all this other stuff. And that's fine and it's fun. But this is why I'm saying there's two parts to the brain. One part of your brain has this just this dopamine explosion. It feels so good to write all that out and push and design it and have that dock. The other side of your brain that you need to exercise and entertain though is the one where you actually play and use it. How usable is this thing you just made? How complex is it? And so the, the two sides of the brain are always warring. You have your analytical designer side but sometimes you need to flip that table over and say, okay, if my dungeon master handed this to me as a player, how would I feel about it? And so I'm about to give you a trick or I, I think it's a tip, a hack, whatever you want to say. I think it's pretty sound, frankly. I'm going to go up this way. Of how you can take those two and what is the bridge? How do you still have fun as a DM, but also serve the players and serve the rules. So let's jump into the chat here. It's a gorgeous day here. It's a little overcast, but uh, I'm glad it wasn't raining. If it's raining, I can't walk. Dustin says he's on time, but on the road. Jared Rogers, hello, love your content. Glad to catch you live. What's going on, Jared? Thank you. It's super good to have you here. I'm really glad you're tuning in and welcome. Uh, and you know what? If any of you are still chilling and you're watching and you haven't subscribed to the channel, a good way to get notifications when we go live, subscribe and then to the like bottom or right of the subscribe button, there's a bell. And if you hit that bell, you get email notifications and sometimes even mobile notifications. Let's see how. <laughs> All right, so what you looking at says, has the FDA approved Carney Concentrate? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're still in the final phase of getting our funding, but we can't get past big pharmaceuticals. Karen Davies says, love this. Awesome. Wild Picks says, War Maker switches it up to show us some love. Nice. Oh, listen, I think you guys are really going to dig hit points. Um, and then Crino says, I mean, I watched your videos to get into D&D, so little tips would be great as I'm still a new player. That's the thing. And we have a lot of fun on these live streams, but I'm not a fool. I understand that, you know, there are a lot of things where I will talk my way into a point and then sort of hit a really good point in the midst of a lot of other stuff. So what Warmaker777 is doing is he's basically taking all the fluff around the, the decent points and he's kind of trimming that. So you just get this concentrated like, hey, oh, this tip. Um, I think it's gonna be really cool. What's going on? Fahad is here. Wild Pick says, when you're talking about designing RPGs, are you actually talking about game design or adventure design with an existing game? A little bit of both. So this could also be when you're writing adventures. And uh, so it's gonna be a simple statement and I'm actually gonna place you all onto a tree as I tie my shoe. Let's see how this works. I hope it doesn't. Ha, that actually worked out pretty well. So. People driving by are probably like, what is happening? I'm tying my shoe as I put you on the fence post. Here. So it's by asking yourself a simple question. Here is the designer's question that you need to ask yourself. This is the trick, this is the hack. When you want to add something to a game, you have to ask yourself this question. And for instance, we'll use an example. Now, if you guys want to throw out some examples in the chat, I can specifically help you but for this example, we'll use our, our gems that I mentioned, right? 
So if I said, and here's the statement, I want to add a system for forging gems into armor so that blank. It's very basic. <laughs> very, very basic. But so many times we have design ideas and we don't know what we're trying to achieve with them. So you need to have a design goal. This comes up a lot. This came up a lot when we were designing the adventure kits. And this comes up a lot like as we're writing a Dead Man's Guide to Dragon Grin, our campaign setting guide. The thing you need to think about is I want to add a new maneuver to combat so that X. So the idea here is what are you trying to accomplish with it? Often, if that question doesn't have an answer, then it's probably not a great idea to add it. Because you have to think of your game design much like a recipe, okay? You have to think, I've got this entire put together system that is like a really well-made soup. What am I going to add to it? So a great example is, I wanna add a habanero pepper to this soup so that it is spicier, okay? That is a good design goal because you understand why you're adding the pepper. But if you just add a habanero pepper, because you're like, oh, I have this around or I have this idea, not realizing what the result is going to be, you're gonna be very sad. <laughs> and so to take that analogy even a little deeper, maybe the game doesn't need, maybe the soup doesn't need a habanero pepper. Maybe it needs green and red bell peppers just for crunch. Maybe it needs an onion. But if you ask yourself, I wanna add X to a game so that I can Y, you'll often find that you either shouldn't be adding something or it gives you very clear uh, direction as to what and how you need to get to that goal. And uh, I'm gonna give you some real life examples of how I use this and how it helped. But first, let's dig into the chat. All right. <laughs> Wild Pig says, I always thought the blue gem was for swimming and the red was for rage. Exactly. As video games have taught us, Stacy Winters. Oh, it's a Baywatch gem. I'll be ready. I just did a little Baywatch for you, Stacy. Wild Pix says overcast equals only one cloud in the sky. It's actually pretty cloudy. I don't know if you can see. Here, I'll show you. For us, anyway. Especially comparatively to the uh, super blue skies we've been having. So, oh man, Alan knows, check for traps. Check out his YouTube channel, check for traps. He says one day at a time, Tim, one day at a time. That's my goal, Alan, to huff and puff less, and then like a year later, look down and be surprised by my abs. Commander Vlogs says, hey, how's it going? What's going on, Commander Vlogs? Just subscribed, and he threw up the horns. So, horns back to you, and uh, thanks for sticking around. <laughs> so, Fahad says, hashtag design goals. Jose Soto is here. So, I wanna give you some real life examples of this, because when you work, especially collaboratively with multiple people, they'll ask you, hey, why'd you do this? Or, hey, I wanna change this. Instead of being, you know, protective and saying, no, don't change my idea. Um, so we're working on a Dead Man's Guide to Dragon Gun right now, and we're creating the regions. And right now, you've got this table for like factions. And the way that it is, is that if you read it from left to right, it's the faction, let's say, is the Copper Jackals. And then it has a goal of theirs, what they want, and then it has what they don't want. Right now, if you read it from left to right, that's us, that's our Dragon Grin, that's canon. But, if you like roll on it multiple times, like Oath of the Frozen King, you can mix and match the factions, their goals, and what they don't want. And so here's the thing. It was brought up, hey, uh, this seems a little confusing. Why would I roll to see the faction, their goal, and the thing that they strive against. And so then, what I had to do, and it's easy, I answered my fellow designers 
with this. I want to include modular tables so that people can customize their region in Dragon Grid. That's a really good, that's a, an answer. That's an answer to keep it. Or at least jump in and say, okay, how can we refine it? Is it confusing? Should we tweak it? That is how you do it. Now, the number one thing I think that we get a little hinky with is mechanics. And where a drop of habanero sauce would do, we decide to grow our own pepper and force it on the players. So my, my advice would be, if you want to add something to the game, first, just add one thing. But secondly, ask yourself a question. Hey, I wanna add this race to the game because X. Well, what's the answer to X? Is that already solved? I wanna add this race to the game because I want a race that represents strength. Okay, reskin the Mountain Dwarfs, you know? Now, I'm not discouraging you from homebrewing. I'm not discouraging you from putting this stuff out, but I'm just saying, if you want to become a little more refined as a game designer and sell your stuff eventually, you have to start thinking this way. And you need to be able to protect your designs in a reasonable way with good, clear statements of why your design choice is. And that's it, that's the number one trick, that's the hack. And I see posts all the time in various Facebook groups. Hey, I wanna do this. But if, you know, if I were being honest, I would wanna reply and go, why? And you'll even see sometimes I'll reply with, what is your design goal? Uh, there was someone who recently, uh, they're creating mechs for their RPG world. But the mechs can only be piloted by a certain size race or creature. And that just seemed a little weird to me at a player level because I thought, yeah, it adds a lot of tone to the world, but what's your design goal? What are you trying to accomplish by limiting it so much to just one race? Because let me tell you what it will probably accomplish in real life. <laughs> it's like, hey, now you're gonna have a lot more people wanting to play a certain kind of race so they can be in mechs. So if that's your design goal of, hey, I actually want to proliferate, I want to proliferate, pow, pow, in Farction, I want to proliferate my realm with a certain race, then give incentives for players to play that race. That makes sense. But if you're just doing it to be cool and for flavor, there are ways to do that. So I would alter the design goal. I would then say, all right, instead of just this size, perhaps this size, gets a bonus. That makes more sense to me. That way, I can play it either way. If I play a smaller race, I get a bonus. But if I don't want to, I can still have the mech and still be cool. And now I'm not having to funnel my character decision. Like, man, I really wanna be a mech pilot. Oh, well, I guess I'm gonna be a halfling or a gnome. So that is a good example. All right, back to the top, back to the top. Commander Vlog says, I love peppers. I might've read that already. What you're looking at is oyster crackers. Karen Davies, I'm eating lunch right now, and now I'm wishing for some habaneros. Habaneros are great. I was really surprised when I figured out that they were orange. I'm not expecting that. <laughs> Crino says, that ain't cloud, I see blue. Michael Maitland, raining here in the great Northwest. So, uh, stay dry, super stay dry. Dustin says, I want to make a crafting guide to make it easier and far less complicated in D&D. Perfect. That is a really good design goal. I want to make a crafting guide so that crafting is easier. That's actually the slipperiest slope for a DM. I'm not saying you, but that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to understand that the left side of our brain is getting dopamine hits from. Like, that's perfect. I want to create a crafting system. I want you to ask yourself, and again, <laughs> I'm not poo-pooing your idea. When was the last time somebody used a crafting system in any game you've ever played? Don't let that discourage you. Inform your design, design decisions. How can I make a crafting system that people will use? That's a really good question. So then you start asking yourself, okay, I want to make a design system so that people will use it for real at the table. 
now you're on a path. So less complicated is a good... Got a phone call there. Ha! Uh, less complicated is a good starting point. But then start digging deeper. What does less complicated mean? And what's your goal? But that's really, really good. I don't want that to sound discouraging. I want that to be an encouragement. I want to spur you on and say, design a crafting system that I want to use at the table when we're taking a short rest. Something that's so interesting and rules light that I could just roll a couple times and, and have something. Rather than, this takes five weeks and, because I get that. The reason why the crafting rules are so complicated is because players will abuse them. But to me, that's where the dungeon master comes in and goes, no, you can't make five swords just because rules is written. Technically, you can make five swords, you know? All right, back to the top. But Dustin, I encourage you and let that be, like I said, a spurring on. I wanna see this crafting system. Logos says, got a game in four hours. Good to get some last minute inspiration. So Logos, check your inbox. If you're not subscribed down in the description to mend the first break, there's some cool character mustard that's perfect for games. Uh, we got one coming out tomorrow at around 11 Eastern. And so that doesn't help you with your game in four hours. But uh, I think that that's exactly what Men the First Break is for and the character muster. All right. Wild Pixes, I'm in the Northwest. We only have one cloud all winter long. Oh, got it. Fahad says, massively hyped for Dead Man's Guide. So am I. Hey, hey, what's going on, Syntax AI? Heavenly Hit Points says, want to hear some dragon tongue? Hi, Los Lot. You are great. Oh, I love it. I love how simple it is. What you looking at? You need to hurry and get a game going using Dragon Tongue. Am I right? RPG Carolina Reaper. <laughs> Fahid, he actually repeated me saying infarction. What that is, uh, whenever, <laughs> that came up as an absolute tabletop inside joke. We were in a chat and I just kept misspeaking. And finally I was just like, blah, 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 I'm having an infarction. And we all had a good laugh about that. Later, Jose. What's up, man? He said, uh, you got to go back to work. Thanks, dude. Thanks for popping in. It was good to see you. What you're looking at says the ability to craft away from the table, which, so that is another question. Me personally, that is a razor's edge to walk. I like thinking about the game in between games, but because I'm so busy, I don't like homework either. So and then, again, just asking questions. You know, we're talking, we're riffing, we're coming up with this idea here. Then a player tells me, yeah, man, I got all these really high rolls away from the table, and so uh, I crafted this Baywatch gem for everybody. So we can all fly now, I'm just saying. So again, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying it'd be really cool if it was simple enough to use at the table. But I do think too that it would be cool to have a little crafting system you could sit down with and, and play. It depends on what your design goal is. So I love it. Warmaker777 is here, everybody. The editor for the new Tabletop Terrors video series, Hit Points, is in our very midst. Warmaker, another shout out. He's killing it. I'm really excited about Hit Points. He says the unofficial Elder Scrolls RPG has an interesting crafting system for alchemy. Instead of requiring specific ingredients, certain portions are so nah, certain potions require certain rarities of ingredients That's, so for instance a health potion could use like a common and a rare ingredient I love that because then it becomes hey DM I want to forage for a rare ingredient and then it's more specific to the location and that kind of stuff Check for traps. Says, Tim, I posted this in the AbTab group, but what's your thoughts on players playing on the side of the dismembered lord? So, I think it's a great concept. I think it's really good. Um, so here's, this is how I would angle players playing on the side of the dismembered lord in our campaign world of Dragongrin. Now, for a quick background, in our campaign world of Dragongrin, the evil has won the good guys lost in this big battle called lightfall about 20 Workout years ago complete. and a dark lord rules the realm so heroes aren't necessarily welcome 
Now, we have created a really cool framing device that we're going to release closer to the time of the Kickstarter to explain why isn't every hero dead and all this. So we've kind of come up with a, uh, uh, just a concept. But here, this is what I would do. If I'm running a game, I would say, what exactly does that mean? When you say they're on the side of the dismembered Lord, how do they know it? So, are they just killing good people? Are they informed by a specific war maker or marrow who works for the dismembered Lord? Have perhaps they heard from the dismembered Lord himself? How does someone in Nazi Germany who hears bombers going overhead and sees the carnage of ground warfare, how do they play on the side of Hitler? Right? And that's a real world example. I'm not suggesting anybody does that, but ask yourself that question. So if I'm a game master and someone pitches me that game, hey, I want you to run this game. What does that mean? Where are they getting their information from? What's the source of their information? How do they know they're on his side? And so that would be my biggest question. Um, but to give you a more practical at the table answer today, like right now, um, the way that I would play it is a war maker who is essentially like granted permission to recruit people. Uh, maybe this is a specific insignia, you know, where you can get get out of jail free points if you do what we say when we say it without asking. So uh, that's the concept that I would run with, which is I would make it so that, especially if I was running a campaign, this would be a really cool campaign framing device, setting it up like a TV show, which is the players are recruited. Perhaps they're all in a pinch together, so you start the uh, campaign with that sort of inciting incident. You know, they're all present at a bank robbery, whatever. But they do something to prove themselves a little better than average, at least. So this war maker sees them, doesn't care about them, but says, hey, you'd be great labor. I could send you on errands and have half of a hope that you wouldn't totally screw it up. So what do they do? Well, he starts giving them missions and tells them, you're doing this in service of the dismembered Lord. That's how I probably started out. And uh, it would create a couple of sources of conflict. One, you know, would the players be open about that? Probably not. Because <laughs> again, if you're in the middle of Nazi Germany, if the Nazis aren't around, you're not going to be like, yeah, I'm all about that life. You're putting yourself at risk from the people you live with. So that would be a source of conflict between the players and then the rest of the townsfolk. Uh, it could also be <laughs> like... Who's to say? What happens if two missions in, some other war maker shows up and says the opposite? Says, what are you doing? You're, you know, you're working in opposition to the dismembered Lord, stand down. Who do they believe? So there's a lot of sources of conflict and part of that comes from the fact that in Dragon Grin, evil is present, but just like in the real world, it's exceptionally difficult to trace it back to a single source and snuff it out. That's one of the reasons why evil is so prevalent. Because it's difficult to catch those who are doing evil. And so, and when you catch those who are doing evil, someone else pops up in their place. So, I think it's a sick idea. I think it's wonderful. I think it's awesome. And, uh, but that is, that is how I would kind of approach it, which is where are they getting the information? Who are they following? How do they know? Um, yeah, so let's go to the chat and see what everybody thinks. Heavenly Hit Point says, I think I love taking so much inspiration from Skyrim since I am Norwegian. That makes perfect sense. Bill Jaimez, what's going on? Howdy, caught it live this time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Good to have you here today, man. Fahad says, Warmaker77, congrats on landing that editing position. And you know what? Pro tip, he just asked. He just asked. Sent in some edited videos. I was like, yeah, you're really good at this. Sounds great. 
it's that's just something you don't really think of but it worked you know it's like if you make sick thumbnails if you make real if you're great at photoshop approach a youtube artist and go hey i'd love to make your thumbnails and have one ready here's what here's an example of what i would do if it's killer you better believe they're going wow okay how much do you charge <laughs> because they want that and if you can do it so that's an idea so who's <laughs> who's good at photoshop who's making them tabletop terrace thumbnail no i'm just kidding that was that was speculative i'm not fishing for a thumbnail maker but all right so dr professor says i'm actually here for a whole video and i was in a league of legends game for most of it <laughs> And dude, there are gonna be people who their whole jam is like, they're like, look, I wanna watch a whole thing, but some are just gonna want those bite-sized chunks that they can put a playlist on and just boom, boom, boom. No comments, no chat, just usable stuff for sure. Uh, and then, yo, Dr. Professor says, hey, by the way, does anybody else play League? Super cool arty. So here's the thing. Check out the Absolute Tabletop Discord. I don't know if you're a part of the Absolute Tabletop Facebook group. I think you are. In the pinned post, there's a link to our Discord. That would be a really good place because people hang out in there and play video games all the time. That would be a super good place to find somebody who plays League. I know a ton of us, including myself, play HOTS, Heroes of the Storm. And I know it's not nearly as complex as League of Legends at a very rudimentary level from someone who's not very skilled at video games. League of Legends reminds me of Pathfinder, and Heroes of the Storm reminds me of D&D 5e. That's the kind of way I think about it. Let's see here, Dr. Professor, sir. That's how it works, IRL, Warmaker. Best mentality to have. Dude, that's what happened. Whenever it comes to Dragon Grin, the toughest process I've always had is everyone is the hero of their own story, meaning the villains can genuinely believe they're heroes. Exactly. And who's the villain when I'm doing evil things to protect my family? That becomes the, I think, the definition of a moral quandary. So, let's see, let's see. Heavenly Hit Point says, my mother lives in a small town surrounded by mountains and snow. Literally feels like a fantasy medieval world. That's awesome. Do you guys celebrate uh, Christmas? If you're okay with sharing that sort of thing. Just seems like it would be an awesome place to celebrate Christmas. What you look at? I says I don't even have to work at making thumbnails; they grow on their own. Dad joke. See how long boxes. Sup, Tim? Congrats! Hi, all. Oh, thank you. Doctor Professor, I love the art style of League, though, for sure. Michael Maitland, thanks for bringing up the digital tools conversation on AvTab Facebook group the other day. Been working on an app myself that I hope to get beta users for soon. Killer. Um, yeah, when James, when he asked me, he's like, hey. You know, I'm going to post about digital tools. I was all about that. And so he got a lot of really good answers. Uh, I, yeah, I think he got a lot of really good answers from people who use digital tools, people who are developing digital tools. And it just kind of, if nothing else, spurred people on to keep working on their projects, you know? And then what you're looking at says, Heavenly Hit Points. Yeah, my mom's family is from the Smoky Mountains for Southeast Kentucky, Harlan County, Corbin Williamsburg area. It's like the Misty Mountains when I visit. Heavenly Hit Point says, yeah, it's an awesome place to celebrate Christmas. This stuff is rad, man, says Josh Bingham. Um, so, those are my design tips. Just <coughs> to kind of wrap it up <coughs> and cough. Just genuinely ask yourself your design goal. I want to create X so that Y. Now, I'm going to give you a prep trick, a D&D &D prep trick that is going to save you a lot of time and heartache. And this D&D &D prep trick is specifically uses, it specifically uses goals. So, instead of saying, hmm, what? What terrain should I use? Oh, what monster? I want you to start with a feeling. I want you to start to how you want the players to feel. You want them to feel like they're in danger? 
now, you know. Okay. You want, to, you want them to feel like they are terrified? Do you want them to feel like they are heroes and champions and just awesome? By starting out how you want the encounter to feel, you can use a similar design statement as game designers and say, to make my encounter feel scary, I need to use X. And then make a list of the things you wanna do to execute your goal. It's fun to just have like random encounters or just be inspired by a movie or a TV show. But every once in a while, you kind of know what you want to go for. You know what would like be really great for the next session. So it's like, man, I want an encounter that would be sad. All right. For my encounter to be sad, I need X. And then you start thinking, what are some sad things that can happen? And you start kind of building from there. Just starting on that foundation can really help so that you're not just sort of wandering around until you bump into something good, you know? Um, I'll give you a great example. As a chef, if you wanted to say, oh man, I kind of want something hearty and uh, savory, that's a great place to start. Now I need to start looking at beef stock and carrots and these different things. Then if I said, oh, you know what? I really want something kind of light and fresh. Summary, totally different recipe. But starting with that mentality can be a lot easier sometimes than just walking into the grocery store and this, in this case, the grocery store is your imagination as you look for encounter ideas. Just wandering down the aisles and saying, huh, yeah, this will work, ah, uh, this will work. And then you get home and you have to try to put together a recipe. It can be really challenging. So instead, plan the tone of the recipe first. If you do that, you will have encounters that more likely hit the tone you're going for. So hopefully that helps. All right, here. What should we look at? says, what does, um, when does America's next top RPG designer start? <laughs> Sign me up. Michael says, thanks for the inspiration. I always say it's really hard to be the lead sled dog and the musher at the same time. That's a really good phrase, man. Always excellent to get an outside push now and then. That's a really good, man, I'm going to coin that myself. I'm going to call it my Michael Maitlandism. Am I saying your name right? Maitland? Or is it Matlin and the eye is silent? Heavenly Hit Points, actually going to visit my awesome mom and watch D&D as well, watching Game of Thrones Season 2. Oh, that's killer. C.A. Hollenbach has a question. I think I have a little bit of time. What is your opinion on programs like Home Brewery? I think it's a cheap trick versus making things using Photoshop. Uh, I don't think anything's a cheap trick that's going to help me get a job done. <laughs> so I think it's great. If that's what you can save time doing, I would totally use that. As a designer... That would be, if I'm gonna sell it, not on the DMs Guild, if I'm gonna sell it as something that we made, I would never use that because it has Wizards of the Coast appearance and it looks like their trade dress and it's sort of like ripping them off. But for something you're gonna use at your table, I would absolutely use it because it's gonna look really slick. Something you wanna share in a Facebook group, yeah, use it. I'll use any tool that I can as long as it's moral and doesn't hurt anybody. Something I can use to get the job done faster, man. And so yeah, I would say the home brewery, jump in there, do it big. But I wouldn't turn around and sell it or anything. But it's a really good way to format in a way that kind of brings your design up a level. If the writing's really good and it's just in a Word doc, people are often very visual. So it's a good way, it's a good middle ground, I think. So yeah, I would totally recommend it. What you're looking at says you should put a pic of the mountains in Discord. Absolutely. And what you're looking at. Uh, would you post the Discord link in here? Warmaker777 is a good resource for setting certain moods. Is a third edition book. Don't quite remember what it's called. I think it's called Heroes of Horror or something like that. That's, man, third edition 3.5 are gold mines for frost settings. And here, like NPCs, just they had all kinds of splat books. It was brilliant. All right. Ah, and then he posted it. That's perfect. The book is about how to set the mood for survival, isolation, horror. That's really good. That's a killer book. Don't have the Facebook, so I'll have to check out the Discord. Yeah, man, check it out. Or lady. It's, that is the Ten Command Tent. I think you're male. 
Anyway, I'm gonna end it here. Uh, it's been awesome hanging out. May you mend the first break. May you kill the first snake. And may you conquer everything you undertake. Slancha. Until next time, may your dice roll high.